Hello and welcome to this British Library food season event, the British Cheese Playlist, generously sponsored by KitchenAid. My name is Polly Russell and I'm the season's founder and curator, working very closely with the food writer Angela Clutton, who's the season's guest director. This is the fourth year of the food season and like seasons before, we have tried to stage as many eclectic and interesting and broad range of subjects and topics as possible. So today we will be exploring artisan farmhouse cheese. Tomorrow we've got the historians Annie Gray and Sue Quinn exploring the 1930s to 1950s cookery writers and cooks Georgina Landimer, who was Churchill's cook, and the cookery writer Florence White. Next week, we've got an event which is going to talk about the politics and practices of restaurant reviewing, which I imagine will be quite lively. And we also have the legend that is Madha Jaffrey in conversation. So to find out more about the food season, check out the food season pages on the British Library website. And just a few points of housekeeping before we start for tonight. Uh, we really value your feedback. There's a feedback tab on your screen and we would love to hear from you. It helps us know how to program events for the future. There's also a donate button. British Library is a charity and again, we'd very much appreciate your donations. There's also a tab for questions. I know the panel would love to hear from you, so please do remember to ask questions. And so to tonight's, e tonight's event, the world of British farmhouse cheese with a really expert panel, Ned Palmer and Harry West, and our chair, Patrick McGiggan. He is a food writer and cheese expert. He's contributed to numerous publications and programs, and he wrote the book, The Philosophy of Cheese, which is published by the British Library and is available on your screen. In 2020, he set up the British Cheese Weekender, an online festival to support small cheesemakers who were really struggling as a result of the COVID pandemic. He regularly hosts cheese and talks and workshops, and so he is, of course, the perfect chair and host for this evening. So over to you, Patrick. Well, thank you, Polly. That was a lovely introduction and uh, lovely to be here. What a, a great honour um, to be part of this um, and a great honour to have two brilliant cheese brains with us. Um, so I'll introduce our, our two guests. Um, so we have Harry G. West, who is a professor of anthropology at the University of Exeter. Uh, where he also convenes the, um, the MA in Food Studies. Um, Harry um, looks quite closely at artisan cheese in, in the cultural economy, exploring how cheesemakers have preserved um, their traditions of, of making cheese, but also transformed them for the, the modern age, and has spent an inordinate, inordinate amount of time visiting cheesemakers all over the world. So uh, all over Europe and in, in Turkey and the US, uh, and of course in the UK. Um, so welcome, Harry. And uh, we also have uh, Ned Palmer, um, cheesemonger extraordinaire. Uh, Ned uh, was a cheesemonger with Trafowans Dairy at Borough Market and at Neil's Yard Dairy. He now runs his own uh, cheese tasting company, hosting events and talks, and is best known, I suppose, for a cheesemonger's history of the British Isle, uh, a, the, a bestseller on looking at the, the history of cheese uh, that was published at the end of 2019 and uh, has been shortlisted for all kinds of awards um, last year. Um, and it's a terrific read. If, if people haven't read it, then please do buy it because it's a terrific, terrific book. Um, we're going to cover quite a lot really in the next hour, several thousand years of, um, of cheese history. We've got four cheeses to taste our way through, possibly five if we have time. Um, it would be lovely if people ask questions. Um, so please do, do send them through on the chat function um, and we'll try to answer them as we go along and we'll, and we'll save a bit of time at the end as well uh, to, to discuss any questions that come up. I think probably we should we should get going shouldn't we with, with some with some cheese what, what do we think Ned I think talk us you, you've curated a fine cheese board I'll show Thank mine you. to the look at this I've got a heaving tray of cheese here what's the first cheese we're going to be tasting? Well, um, the first one, if you like goats, is Dorston. So that's this lovely grey tower here. That's a goat's cheese, quite a fresh young goat's cheese. A very simple, simple low-tech cheese, which I think is the first kind of cheese people were making in the British Isles in 4000 BCE. And in the book, it was Mary Holbrook Slatelet, but um, 
Mary's it's not around anymore, so neither. So she's for those of you who are not goat fanciers, there's the St. Jude made by the lovely Julia Cheney. Mine's quite a gloopy, a lovely cheese. So either Dawson or, or St. Jude is your first cheese. And this you chose this now because this sort of represents the the first cheeses ever made in Britain. Well, I'm, I'm guessing, but I hope it's a fairly educated guess. Um, the, the evidence for early cheese making around 4000 BCE is, is really just shards of pottery with traces of dairy fat on them. Um, maybe some of them are pierced so that, you know, the cheese moulds. And when you look at the size and shape of them, it's, it looks to me very much like something that would make that kind of cheese. Like I said, it's very low tech. You only really need some milk and a couple of buckets and some sort of straining device and you could make something like that. So in a way, I think it seems obvious that that sort of thing was the was the earliest cheese, the first kind of cheeses people made. I'm sure they ended up making more sophisticated cheeses than that. That's the kind of stuff we have the evidence for. And we think it would have been goat's milk? Well, I sort of cheated a little bit, maybe. I think that predominantly it was cows in in what would become Britain at that time, especially definitely in Ireland, the Cader fields are a Neolithic field system and it seems quite likely they were dairy and they were cows. But I, I really wanted to use a goat's cheese um, and Mary made this very simple fresh cheese and it happened to be a goat. So I picked that. Also, I think goats other than dogs were some of the first animals that humans domesticated. So do you think the Ur cheese was goat's cheese? Yeah. And, and Harry is, I mean, in your research into, into cheese making, is, is sort of goat's milk cheeses, those sort of early cheeses, is that something you've, you've looked at and the sort of technologies that were used? Uh, yeah. Sort of early well, like, again, I, I, well, I'm sort of guessing. I mean, I assumed, and, and part of the jumping off point of the book was going and making cheese with Mary. And the kit, even if it's made of plastic and metal, is so simple. You think if a cheese maker from... 6,000 years ago came to dairy, they would recognise it. I saw some shards of cheese moulds in an archaeological museum in um, Lisbon, in Portugal, same size and shape as Mary's moulds. So I feel reasonably sure that it was that kind of tech and even that size and shape because the moulds look the same. So it's a good, it's a good guess. And yeah. ha I mean, Harry, they were... Cool. Sorry, I was going to say, Harry, I mean, in terms of your research, if you... Have you looked into this sort of early sort of technologies? I know sort of cheese making technology is an area you're quite sort of interested in. So these very sort of early basic goat's cheeses, or, or they could have been cow's milk cheeses, is that an area that you've looked at? I mean, have you met cheese makers today on your travels who are making cheese in a in a similar way? Well, yeah, I mean, there are certainly cheese makers today who are making these uh, cheeses that are, uh, you know, a simple lactic set, which is, is what we're talking about here. Cheeses that are made from, from the acidification of milk, the fermentation of, of, of milk. Um, and they continue to exist on, on the landscape, uh, you know, in, in, in most places. Um, uh, we also find, you know, the emergence of, of rennet set cheeses um uh you know thousands of years ago the hittites uh, actually were using rennet uh, uh to make cheeses and um you know the cheeses that are described um uh you know being produced in the cave by the cyclops in the in 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 uh you know the odyssey um they are uh very similar to contemporary feta cheeses and they would have been renneted uh most likely um so you have those two different ways of making cheese. Certainly renneting is, is a more sophisticated way of making cheese. It leads to a firmer curd and a firmer curd creates the possibility of being able to age a cheese for longer, um, to achieve deeper flavor notes, to do things like, uh, you know, put them in caves um, and have them interact with, with the environment there, um, you know, be, be colonized by molds and, and, and you know, that, that will create uh, flavor profiles that you don't get with younger uh, cheeses that are made, you know, by a simple lactic set. So it, it thinks for people who are watching into the, that lactic set, what, what's actually happening to the milk uh, if, for that to happen? When you say a lactic cheese, what do you mean? Well, acidification means that the the the, the pH is 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 lowering, right? Um, and that that changes the biochemistry of the milk. It changes the polarity of the of the molecules of the protein uh, micelles, 
and it leads to a very simple kind of, of stitching together of those proteins into a kind of curd mesh. Um, when you introduce rennet into a cheese, uh, rennet is an enzyme. It is, uh, if you're using animal rennet, it is derived from uh, the stomach of, of, of the uh, calf or the, or, the, or the lamb, for example. Um, and of course, you know, in the stomach of the calf or lamb, it would have helped to coagulate the, the cheese and make it more digestible. Um, but cheesemakers learned early to extract that enzyme and to use it to their own uh, purposes in, in making cheese. Uh, animal rennets aren't the only rennets that you can use. Uh, there are a whole range of um, uh, plants uh, that can be used in renneting. Cardoon, for example, uh, cardoon uh, thistle um, is widely used in the Mediterranean. Most Portuguese uh, sheep's milk cheeses are uh, made using cardoon. Uh, but there are other uh, substances, fig sap and, and, and ladybed straw and, and um, nettle, for example, can be used in renneting uh, cheeses. Uh, Ned, I mean, in terms of sort of British history and that, that, those, those early cheeses that you wrote about in your book, um, did it did it give did it give people a, a sort of an advantage to be able to eat cheese? I mean, it, because it's a nutritious food stuff, isn't it? It is. It is. Oh, yeah, it, and it, it's. it's a lovely question, and um, there's a sort of loaded element to the question in that um, it was an advantage to be able to digest milk as an adult, and naturally humans couldn't, and they only began to be able to. Well, we find the first evidence about a thousand years after the first evidence for cheese making. So I know we slightly disagree on this, but I think that people learned how to make cheese and that made the milk digestible. And that was a great thing. They were able to use all of that nutrition as adults. Um, but definitely, I mean, you're preserving food. So you have a flush of milk in the spring and summer and no fridge, you can't keep it for the winter. So you get thin. If you can make a cheese, and as Harry says, once you start using rennet and make an aged cheese, it's a great advantage to you. It's a great food if you're an explorer or if you're colonizing Europe from the fertile crescent or, you know, so it does. Yeah. Yeah. Great traveling food, food for soldiers, too, sadly. Yeah. Well, I, I, we should probably talk a little very quickly about Doorstone and who makes it and why it's mm. absolutely delicious. Because I mean, I've been nibbling on mine as we've been talking. Great cheese. I did. I did sneak a bit. It's made by a fellow called Charlie Westhead. He's a lovely man. Um, and. Charlie worked for Niels Dairy, and uh, I think he was their first full-time employee and they, they sent him off to make cheese when a couple of people decided to stop and this is how it works at the dairy, you were just sent. So, so Charlie became a, a cheese maker and in that way he's really intimately connected to this history of the, you know, the renaissance that we, that we talk about. So he started in the early 80s, now makes cheese in Hereford um, and this I think is, I would say it's kind of based on a a French style, like a Loire Valley cheese. So the thing that happened is that by the 70s, we'd lost nearly all of our cheese making tradition and our artisanal knowledge and people had to go to the continent to, to, to find out how to make these sorts of things. And that's, I think, where the inspiration for that comes from. It is a very simple style. It's got a lovely moussey texture, which does come from a tweak. And I love this bit of geekery. He pre-drains the curd, so you set your curd with your starter culture in that rennet, and then he drains it in a muslin bag. And that draining causes a sort of fluffy, open, moussey texture, which is glorious. Yeah, I'm the texture on that is, is remarkable, isn't it? It's just sort of, yeah, it's, it has that lovely lightness. I think, so the, the, we, perhaps I didn't explain at the beginning, I mean, we, we've got a cheese board through time, basically, haven't we? So we're starting... Mm -hmm with a cheese that is, you know, represents those early, early cheeses. I think we should sort of jump forward um, uh, several hundred years um, and, and move on to St. James, um, which, uh, well, Ned, do you want to explain why, why you've chosen St. James? Why it, we've got this. Yeah, why, where, where are we at in, in history with this at? cheese? So if we've rushed through history and we've arrived in um, the early... Middle, middle medieval period with the monasteries which flourished in in Britain you know after the Normans turned up um, and this is a style called a washed rind it's got a sort of pinky terracotta colour to it washed rind's quite funky quite barnyardy and I think a lot of people would agree that they were most likely invented or developed or discovered by 
monks in monasteries. So I think this is a very monastic cheese, not something we think of as a British style, but I'm quite convinced that, that, that they were made in the monasteries in that period, just because they were eminently networked. And I think an abbot went over to Normandy, tried some lovely uh, Pont Levesque style wash rind and came back and said to his cheese maker, Joanna, you've got to make me this wash rind, here's the recipe. So I do think that they were um, a cheese of that period. And I think they were as, as rich, creamy cheese, I think they were for the abbot and his posh guests. And I think that, 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 that they also made harder skim milk cheeses to feed the, the choir yeah. monks and, and to sell. Very much that period, sheep's milk, which, which pretty much all the cheese in Britain was until the later medieval period, partly because the monks had a lot of sheep. And um, Harry, we, we were talking before this event about sort of sheep's milk in, in Britain generally, and, and, and sort of, you know, it's seen as quite a new thing, really, sheep's milk cheeses in the UK as part of this renaissance in British cheese that we've had. But you were saying, actually, there's this sort of long history of sheep's milk um, cheese making. Well, yeah, there's a deeper history of sheep's milk cheese making, certainly uh, uh, around the Mediterranean and, and, and up in, into Europe. Um, and, and you would have found them in, in Britain as well. But the, the breeding of sheep in Britain became very specialized uh, centuries ago uh, with the focus on the wool industry. And with that, that focused breeding, um, the, the, the flock, the national flock became much more specialized and uh, cheese making um, uh, you know, fell, fell by the wayside to, to a significant degree. I, I, it's always stunning to me. I live in Devon and um, to look around and see flocks everywhere, but very few people uh, make cheese because the tradition sort of fell dormant. Uh, we see it emerging a little bit uh, again now, and quite fortunately, because they're, they're lovely cheeses. Um, but, you know, I, I work with cheesemakers in Portugal, for example, for whom um, the idea that you wouldn't use uh, your flock to produce wool, meat, and cheese um, is uh, incomprehensible. Uh, you know, the idea that you wouldn't be getting three times the value out of your flock. Um, so, you know, it, it, um, it, it, the, the, the sort of circumstances of history will create very different dynamics and very different equations for people who are making those choices in different places. And so it's interesting. So sheep, sheep's milk cheeses sort of became, sort of died out almost in the UK, but then have come back. Why, why do you think they've come back now? What, what, why? Because there, there has been a, a big surge in the number of sheep's milk cheeses being made in the UK in the past sort of 10, 15 years. But why is that, do you think? Well, there certainly has. And there's been a big surge of, of artisan cheeses of all kinds being made in the UK. And I think that the UK, because it lost so many of its cheeses, um, you know, as as food and farming in this country became industrialized over the past couple of centuries, really, um, that uh, to some extent, uh, people are looking elsewhere for references. Um, and they're uh, finding cheeses that fill, you know, places on the cheese board um, uh, in, in other traditions and saying, well, we can do that here. Often they're also then uh, looking deeper and finding connections locally and saying, well, once upon a time we did do that here. Yeah, this is it. We've had, we've had a few questions coming in. And, and actually, I think I, I was going to come back to you, Ned, about in terms of this sort of monastic cheeses and, and, and washed wine cheeses, because this, this St. James is made up in Cumbria by a great cheesemaker called Martin Gott. And um, it's got a really pungent sort of funky rind, isn't it? When you smell mm. it, it, you know, there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's microbiology going on on this cheese, isn't there? And we've had a few people asking, you know, do we eat the rind? What do you mean by a sort of monastic style? Do, do you want to explain a bit more about that sort of washed rind cheese? I would love to. I let, there is a lot of microbiology going on. Of course, before, you know, I don't know, Robert Koch in the 19th century, they didn't know it's microbiology, so they thought it was magic or, 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 or the work of God or, or a goddess or something, which is I think is lovely. Uh, so the main microorganisms that's doing the heavy lifting on, on this cheese is a a, a bacteria called Brevibacterium linens or B linens to its friend, which is a sort of orangey pinky colour and has those flavour notes, funk, barnyard. My editor made me remove all of the more crude ones that I put in the book. Um, 
as to being monastic, um, how can I do this swiftly? So um, peasants, peasant women, because it was the women who made cheese, didn't have very many animals. And uh, so they tended to keep the milk for a day or two until they had enough milk to make cheese. And that milk was quite acidic, which lends itself to mold ripened cheese. But the bacteria of the St. James doesn't like that acid. Monks had lots of animals, so had lots of milk, and they could make every day. And the milk was sweeter, less acidic, and lent itself to that sort of rind developing. And I think what happened, it, it, it loves salt water. To make it happen, you wash the cheese with salt water, and that encourages that bacteria to grow. But I suspect that the early ones just happened. Hungry, bored monks who, you know, just ate bread and pottage and, um, and so on, if they were the choir monks, would have tasted, thought it's lovely and meaty and funky. Oh, wow, I wonder how we do that. How do we make it come back? And unlike the peasant women who were busy looking after everyone, looking after the goats and so on, they had some time to start experimenting and became the first affineurs, the per first people who ripened cheese. So I think the monastic environment was really fertile for making that kind of cheese. That's why I think it's, it's, it's monastic. And it's, uh, Eat the rind, the rind is lovely. Yeah, I was going to say, well, I have been eating the rind and it, I think it really, it sort of adds to the flavour, doesn't it? Um, yeah. But I mean, you mentioned sort of women in cheese making. I mean, that this is we should probably sort of talk about this a bit more because Harry, we were talking before about um, Sister Noella, who um, so we're talking about sort of microbiology of cheese and um, sort of women's role in cheese. But Sister Noella in the US, uh, I think, does she make a washed rind cheese that is similar? She does. She makes a cheese called. She makes a cheese called Bethlehem, which is very similar to a Saint Nectaire. So it's it's more of a kind of um, bloomy rind um, uh, cheese. Um, but yeah, that's the the first cheese maker that I ever made cheese with was was Sister Noella in in Connecticut um, when I was still living in the States. I mean, it's a very interesting topic, the the topic of women in in cheese making, and. It differs from place to place. Um, for example, uh, there are many places in, in the north of Europe or uh, in the Alps where women would have been involved in, uh, in milking and making cheeses, where, whereas men would have been involved in taking care of the herds. Um, around the Mediterranean, uh, more frequently where transhumans is practiced, where um, uh, shepherds or herdsmen will take their flocks from one place to another with the seasons, often over vast distances, um, those, uh, you know, transhumance was practiced largely by men. And so it was men who were making the cheese in the places in which, to which they were taking the animals. So you have these different traditions that are embedded in different natural ecologies and different, uh, you know, cultural uh, practices as well. Yeah, it's, I mean, because I mean, thinking in, in the UK, we have some terrific female cheesemakers. I mean, actually, some, some of the, you know, many of the best cheesemakers we have are, are women, which is, is that unusual in the food industry? Is, is cheese a, a, a particular food style that, you know, women have historically made? Or is, is, is this, you know, is this just a, how it's evolved in the UK? Well, in, in the UK context, um, a lot of cheese was made on larger estates. And so it would have been made with dairy maids milking um, and often making the cheese uh, in, in, the, in the cheese room, but they might not have been the owners of the flocks or herds. Um, whereas uh, today, for example, a lot of the you know, most interesting dynamic cheesemakers in the UK scene are, are women um, and they are proprietors of the business. They own the flocks, they own the, they own the, the, the land um, and they are the, uh, are the cheesemakers. So, you know, it, it's always within the context in which we live. And of course, the political economy is different now. Um, the gender division of labor is different now. Um, and that's reflected in, in, in cheese making. I mean, I would say that women have had very interesting and important roles, but those roles have differed over time in the UK. Yeah. Ned, did you want to come in on that? So, oh man, uh, how much time we've got. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that, that, that Harry says, and, it's, and, it, and it, it seems to differ by country a bit within the UK, but one thing I learned from, from doing the research of the book 
I assumed that when we talked about monastic cheese, I had an image of jolly red-faced monks with their arms in their fat. And then I found that for the most part, wherever I found manuscript evidence, it was women. And they were running the dairies. So they did have some kind of managerial position and I think some clout. And I actually know the name and I love this, the name of a 16th century cheesemaker. She, she ran Sibton Abbey Dairy in Suffolk. She was called Catherine Dow. She got a pound a year, which is a lot. Even, and her assistant's called Alice Harris. There's two women who made cheese. But there's a thing, she got more cheese than butter. Then, then, so you made cheese and you made butter, and how much cheese and how much butter you made is very regimented. They knew exactly how much you'd get, so they could tell if you're stealing any. She makes more cheese and less butter. I think she argued with her boss, the uh, seller of the monastery, and said, "We'll make the cheese better if we skim less fat off, and we'll make less butter. We'll make fattier cheese. It taste better. Be more." No. So I love. I think you can see just in some figures the real skill. And possibly I am, you know, hugely extrapolating here that someone had a bit of clout. Um, and, and to step forward a, a long time in the 19th century, the late 19th century, women were just erased from the dairy industry in Ireland, just massively from 40% of the industry to one in six, I think it was. And then in England, that did not happen so thoroughly. And you still saw women as managers of businesses, and I think, like Harry said, they weren't, they didn't own the land, they didn't own the, the flocks or the herds, but they did have considerable responsibility in running those dairies. But also, again, it varied from region to region and depending on what you were doing. So it's a much more, it's always as a bit of everything, it's much more nuanced and complex than we think when we go into it. Yeah, it's, but there's a, a really good questions come in actually from uh, uh, Sarah Moore. Um, which sort of leads us on to the next cheese, I think. But she, she was asking at the dissolution of the monasteries, um, you know, the monks would have gone. But what was their cheese legacy, do you think, sort of left over from what they did? I mean, does that sort of move us, sort of what happened next, I suppose? Um, but, you know, is, is their influence still was sort of felt? I, suspe I suspect that the cheesemakers who worked for the monastic dairies needed a job and moved onto the farms where the new class of yeoman farmers needed to make rent because their um, aristocratic landlords had up the rents, needed cash business. And I, I suspect, given they were doing some large scale cheese making in the monasteries, there's a monastery in um, Kent in I think, the 14th century making, I think 8,000 kilos a year is quite a lot. So maybe they brought the expertise of large scale, consistent, almost you know, commercial cheese making to farms where perhaps before then the, 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 the woman had made smaller you know, amounts of cheese to feed the family or sell in local market, markets. Maybe it looks to be standardized monastic cheese making from the little evidence you can find. They have set sizes of cheese that they have names for. And so I wonder if they brought that sort of standardization and a more economy of scale. To, to, to then to, to the sort of what you call it, the, the lay population. That's yeah, what I guess. What, should we move on to the next cheese? I see that the, the clock is ticking. Um, we, I have to say, we're sort of jumping around on the cheese. We, we're eating the cheese in, in an order that I probably wouldn't normally eat because we're going to move to blue now um, and, then, and then finish with the cheddar, which is sort of, but we're sort of trying to stick with the history, aren't we? That, that was your, your thinking, I think, Ned and Harry. But what have we got next? We've got, we've got this beautiful, I mean, I've got this piece of cheese, which is, you know, just huge, a lovely big blue piece of Stitchelton. Um, why, why have we got this cheese? What, what's this telling us about British cheese history? Uh, who's going first? Ed, do you want to start? Thanks. Um, so this is a still, <laughs> Stilton is the cheese of the 18th century, and I won't take any argument with that. I just think it's very... It makes me think of red-faced squires, quaffing port and, and, and so on. But it was, it's because it came to prominence in the 18th century, partly because of road building, which had been rubbish up until then, after the Romans left, and partly because the economy is beefed up because the Act of Union, so in Scotland. Uh, Daniel Defoe invented tourism and he wrote his book, A Tour Around the Island of Great Britain, where he mentions Stilton and calls it Our English Parmesan. So it really... It became kind of nationally famous. I like to think it was the cheese people ate, middle-class foodies ate on their um, 
on their tables down in London. So I think it it personifies the century for me, essentially growth and integration of a nation and better roads, better infrastructure and, and branding. You know, I think there's a whole story about Stilton's birth that we might get round to that I think is an act of great sort of branding. And then Stitchelton obviously we'll get to as a sort of thorny issue that the cheese we've got is not called Stilton. <laughs> that in a bit well let's let's talk i mean let, let's it, it tell the story of stitchelton which is the cheese we're eating um so based on a stilton recipe but not allowed to be called stilton harry no. or should we because harry we'll be talking about sort of protected cheeses and you know there, there's a whole system of um across europe about sort of protected cheeses so rock fork can only come from rock fork, for example um, and Stitchelton's an interesting cheese in, in that regard, isn't it? Would do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, that's right. So what we're talking about here are geographical indications. Um, anybody who's looked at a wine bottle and seen Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée, that's a, a, a controlled place name, right? Um, and in the European Union, of which uh, Britain was, was a part until recently, um, they're called protected designations of origin. And these are designed to protect the producers of a product from uh, imitators elsewhere who would benefit by their reputation, right? Um, calling themselves by, by the name of the place uh, that has achieved fame when in fact they're not producing there. But what we have with Stilton and, and the Stitchelton story is a, a sort of case in which to, to achieve this status as protect, with a protected designation of origin, you have to identify what the defining characteristics of the product are and what the, um, what the protocols are for making it, you, you, the agreed, agreed upon norms for making it. And the Stilton PDO um, eventually decided that they would define the cheese, among other things, as being made from pasteurized milk this at a time when they were concerned about food scares and, and the reputation of the cheese as a result of them. So what you have is, is Stilton can, can no longer be made using raw milk as it was historically. So enter uh, uh, um, uh, Randolph Hodgson, uh, who uh, is the founder of Niels Yard Dairy, um, and Joe Schneider, uh, uh, an accomplished cheesemaker. And together they decide to produce a cheese that is um, made the way a Stilton would have been made um, in the past, not only from raw milk, but made um, uh, you know, at, at a scale in a, in a way that it would have been made in the farmhouse previously. So it can't be called Stilton because it doesn't follow what are the contemporary rules for the production of Stilton, but in many ways it reflects what Stilton was historically um, uh, you know, with, with a greater de degree of accuracy. And is that, is, I mean, it's an interesting question around PDOs and, and that you have sort of a, a lesser level of protection called a PGI, is that they're there to protect tradition. Is that, is that, that's the point of them, is it? But then in some ways, the Stilton PDO is protecting something that is not traditional. You know, Stilton yeah. would historically have been made with raw milk. That's, there's some tension there, isn't there? Well, that's right. And, and, you know, there are a significant number of, of PDOs. There are dozens of them in France and Italy, for example. Um, and some of them I, I would define as being conservative in that they uh, define the, the characteristics and the methods of production in ways that um, are deeply historical. Other ones um, are more liberal in their, in their definitions. And you have to remember that it is the makers themselves who band together and petition for a PDO. And it's the makers who, who determine what the rules are going to be. And in some cases you have large producers who are involved in this process and they have different ideas about what you know, the ideal uh, methods of production are. Um, and those can come to predominate um, if they achieve the status of a PDO, they come to define the cheese. So they can be used to protect, to protect you know, historical uh, practices, but they can also be used to legitimate the transformation of practices into something new. Um, I worked with cheesemakers in, in uh, Portugal uh, who made a cheese called Serpa um, from sheep's milk. And they made them from local breeds 
until the very moment when they got a PDO and the PDO did not specify that they had to use local breeds. And then suddenly they felt free to use, uh, uh, you know, uh, breeds that were more productive, but not traditional to the place. Because after all, they had a stamp that said, we're traditional, right? <laughs> So, uh, Ned, I mean, the, the, the kind of the protection of Stilton and, you know, it's, it's obviously a, a valuable British cheese asset, Stilton. Um, but what always cracks me up is that you can't actually make Stilton in Stilton. So the village of Stilton is outside the PDO. Yes, it is. And, yeah. and is that, I mean, historically, is that right? I mean, you know. I well, know Stilton historians, everyone falls out with each other about where Stilton They really is. do. Yeah, they do. it's quite a fierce debate. And um, that bit in the Stilton chapter was a lot longer. It was about three times the length of the whole chapter because I found that Patrick Ranks, who's the great British cheese writer, says it was never made in Stilton, ever. It was made in Quenby Hall. And he's absolutely certain. He just knows it. Lovely man. Um, uh, another fellow, Trevor Hitman, who's much more specialised Stilson story, and thought it really was. And he quotes a guy who, who a late 18th century, remembers it being made in Stilson in the early 18th century, but it was in a pub, it's just some guy in a pub, you know. Um, so I never managed to settle on whether I thought it ever actually had been made in Stilton or not. And took great pleasure in making that just really uncertain. Um, <laughs> So one thing I think is it got its name in a way because people had it in Stilton at the Bell Inn, very famously, you know, uh, and I think Defoe talks about going there, but, but, and so I had this great cheese in Stilton, you get bored of saying it, so Stilton. I don't think anyone ever made Caffili in Caffili, it's a city, you don't make cheese there. So you call it Caffili because it's the market, or Cheddar, maybe they made cheese there. So, so I think sometimes the geographical naming is about where it was marketed or sold, or I do think there's a bit of marketing around Stilton. There's Guy Cooper Thornhill, the landlord of the Berlin, and he was a famous horseman. He did this famous ride like Dick Turpin. And, and he, he doesn't really talk about it during his lifetime. He's not connected. With it. After he dies, he becomes connected to the story. I feel like it's the halo effect of branding. So in a sense, I don't really care whether it was made in Stilton or not. Also, how do we know what it was? Defoe calls it our English Parmesan. Some of the recipes I've seen would make rock hard cheese like bullets. Some of the recipes are softer. So would we even, if we went back in time, and that's where I would go back, back to Stilton in the 18th century and answer, would we use it as that? Yeah, well, actually, the, I, the questions keep coming up on the chat and then they disappear into the ether <laughs> in a mysterious way. So I'm reading them and trying to remember them. But someone was asking, historically, when would Stilton have been eaten as part of a meal? Would you, would you have it in the beginning, of, you know, before pudding, after pudding? Would it be the meal itself? But from what you're saying, Stilton could have been any number of cheeses and you, yeah, could, you could have, have had lots of yeah. cheeses. Yeah, and I might depend who you were. I mean, I doubt that the, 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 the ploughman got Stilton. I think it was too full cream cheese for them. They got the hard cheese. But they would have had their cheese for their lunch, you know. It just it was a main meal with bread. And then if you were posh, you had it some other time. And oh, it's a shameful gap in my knowledge. I don't know what the 18th century cheese etiquette was back then. <laughs> Someone, someone was also asking about raw milk, uh, just in general. Um, and actually, Harry, this might be a good one for you be because of all the countries you visited and uh, the US connection as well. So she was asking about, you know, in some countries, uh, there are quite strict laws about using raw milk um, in cheese and in others, not so much. And she was asking, why is that? And why, what impact does that have on, on the cheese? Why, why is raw milk important? Yeah, no, it's a very interesting question. Sometimes the answer to that is very surprising. I mean, I, I tend to think of lactophilic and lactophobic uh, uh, countries. Um, and, and some are very suspicious of the idea of the consumption of raw milk. The United States is, is, is clearly one of them. Um, but there are countries like Ireland, like um, uh, Turkey, that are very assertive in prohibiting uh, the use of raw milk. And it, it seems from, from what I can tell to be very much bound up with a kind of trying to, to assert a sense of, of food hygiene, of, of modern practices in food hygiene, often because 
they're places that, relatively speaking, might be uh, considered to 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 not be as modern in their food, uh, uh, you know, production uh, techniques. Whereas countries like France and Italy, um, who have very modern food sectors, also are very comfortable with the elaboration of you know protocols for making sure that people are using raw milk in ways that are safe. And in terms of, the, you know, there's a whole discussion about, you know, is raw milk cheese better? I'd be quite interested on both your opinions on that, really. You, you know, there, there's a feeling that raw milk makes better cheese. It, it, do you agree? And, and why is that? What, why, why would people think that if that is the case? Um, well, it, it, I'll say this. I, I think that you can make excellent cheeses from pasteurized milk. Um, many of, of the finest artisan cheeses made in this country are made from pasteurized milk. Um, but raw milk does provide some, some advantages. I mean, people who are advocates of it will say that you get a broader sort of diversity of uh, strains of, um, of microbes in the milk. And therefore, what you get is a kind of, of broader taste palette, right? Um, instead of everything firing on exactly the same note, it, you, you get a kind of chord, so to speak. Um, and that gives a depth and a complexity to the flavor. Very often, uh, raw milk cheeses, when you taste them, the, the flavor develops over a period of time and you get little, little bursts, little waves, almost like a kind of um, fireworks uh, uh, you know, uh, show. <coughs> Come on, Ned. I know you're desperate. Oh, to God, I mean, I think what, this. What, just what Harry said, and, and that was it, really. If you, Harry, if you want to do some of my tastings, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> I'm loving I, fireworks. You know, you, I like that. You can yeah. Make, yeah, it was great. You can make rubbish cheese from raw milk if you're a rubbish cheese maker, and you can make fantastic cheese the other way around. And I like, you know, one is slightly cautious about this idea of complexity and length and depth and all those things because sometimes you taste a bit of Colston Bassett or Coulee great pasteurized cheeses, Malines, and you kind of think, well, how could this be any more complex than it is? And we would have to do some randomized double blind testing, which I volunteer for. Um, I like the sense of the terroir, the cheese, the milk coming from that farm. And in the old days, up in, in the early 20th century, people bought milk from small dairy. They liked that milk from that farm and they could taste it, the variation from that farm. And this also speaks to a modern notion of the microbiome terroir. So the terroir of your very microbes that live on in your soil and in your dairy and so on, the nice microbes. And I love the idea, and I think pasteurization would smooth out that variation, but I always question myself because I might be being romantic. And I sometimes think if you gave me Colston, Bassett and Stuchelton, and they were both very similar ages and so on, both excellent, I might struggle to tell you which was the raw or the, or the, 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 the pasteurized. The other thing I'd say is that pasteurizing bashes the milk about. And this Stitcherton has an amazing creamy texture. It comes from right next door, the cows right next door, very slow pump, very gentle, and then no pasteurization, no rushing around a pasteurizer getting battered. And that does give you very, very rich, creamy cheese. So it is, it is tasting absolutely remarkable. Glorious. That's it, yeah. and I have to say, fireworks on the tongue is, a, I like that. I'm going to, I'm going to nick that for an article, Harry. <laughs> um, but I think we should probably move on to another raw milk cheese, another absolute stonker of a, a, a British cheese, which is, um, we're going to move on to cheddar, jumping forward again, um, uh, well, how, where are we now? We're, we're, we're with Westcombe cheddar, but What's this? Why did you choose this cheese, and what what period of British cheese making does cheddar represent? So uh, cheddar brings you the nineteenth century, particularly maybe the industrial revolution, the agricultural revolution, that huge growth and scale of of industry. And uh, cheddar, people were making cheddar for a long time before then. Um, there's a lovely mention. I've got my reading glasses on. It's the uh, I think it was the 15th or 16th century, they talk about it being one of the greatest cheeses in the world. So people knew about it. But again, I wonder what that was like. Westcombe, Montgomery's, these our current crop of, of traditional farmhouse cloth-bound cheddars, I think have their roots 
in 19th century cheddar making, a guy called Harding was a famous cheddar maker, and particularly a woman called Edith Cannon, because she helped a guy called F.J. Lloyd to write a sort of codification of how to make consistently good cheddar in that industrial market. You needed a product that you can make to some degree of scale, but make it consistently good. And so he tried to codify that with the help of an expert cheesemaker, Edith Cannon, who was a very young woman at the time. She started making cheese when she was 14. I think she was in her early 20s when she did this. And that one thing is I just love the idea that, again, in the 19th century, in that atmosphere of, of, of gender relations, you had a young working class woman, you know, being hired to do this amazing job of helping this guy to fix up what this kind of cheddar would be. And when he describes what he thinks of as perfect cheddar, and also when Harding does, I think it, the texture and um, flavour profile are very much like this. I chose it, it's a classic Somerset cheddar. I love the story because Tom Calver's family went over to factory, well, you know, block industrial style cheddar and then went back, I think in the early nineties to farmhouse making. But also I only found out when I rang Tom up, say, can I come down, what do you make cheese? I said, have you heard of Edith Cannon? And he said, yeah, she used to make cheese on the farm. Lid. And I was absolutely blown away. Went down there and at one point he lifted up another and pointed at a stone building and said that's where she used to make cheese at which point I burst into tears and he laughed and said yeah everyone says all the mongers come cry when they see that but so that's why and um yeah as much as cheddar has been around for a few hundred years before then I really feel it had its moment in, in that period. And uh, Harry I mean the industrialization of cheddar because well as Ned mentioned there you know to block cheddar, factory cheddar. I mean, so we, so we had to, the cheese we're eating is not that. It's a sort of traditional cloth bound Somerset cheddar. But cheddar sort of took off, didn't it, as, as, the, as this sort of global commodity. And, and the US played quite a big role in that, as I understand it. Yeah, I mean, cheddar, uh, you know, where, where the English went, they took their cheddar with them. And the US was one of the places in which they did that. Um, cheddar making became very well developed, particularly in New England. Um, and the emergence of the first factories that, that we can properly call that, where people are harvesting milk from multiple farms and producing cheese from that milk is in the United States. Um, that, that takes place in the 1850s. And by the 1860s, when the American Civil War happens and men uh, uh, who would have been working on the farm are, uh, you know, in the military fighting in the war, um, women are struggling to do everything on the farm. And so one of the tasks that can be outsourced is the production of cheese. So factories for the production of cheese boomed in that period and after the, after the war as well. So that, you know, by the, the latter decades of, of the 19th century, uh, America was producing uh, cheddar on a larger scale, uh, more cheaply than in, than in, than in Britain, and uh, exporting it back uh, to Britain. Um, and it became uh, really a problem for cheddar uh, producers in, in, in Britain to, to compete with them. Yeah, I, I always think that's quite funny, isn't it? Because the, 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 the sort of the early, the father, you know, Joseph Harding, the father of British cheddar, sort of was very open, wasn't he? And would invite parties of, um, you know, parties from all over the world to come and visit his his dairy and show them how he made cheddar. And then they went back and turned it into factory cheese. He, he, he knew what was, he knew that that was happening. To, uh, he was obviously just a really generous spirit, which I find in cheesemakers really generally. But he did teach an American guy called Xerxes A. Willard how to make cheddar. And the guy went, a guy tried to marry his daughter or tried to marry Hardy's daughter off to someone in America saying, then we'll win the palm if we can have your daughter's skill. But, and then went off and showed everyone how to do this. And then Harding, if I'm right, wrote an article in one of those agricultural society journals saying, listen, I've just taught this fellow how to make cheddar. So you better be on your toes, mates, because, because, you know, I've done this. He taught the Scottish, the Ayrshire delegation how to do it. And they started making great cheddar and wiped Dunlop off the map, sort of English cheese imperialism. And his son, went, Henry, went and taught the Aussies how to do it. And after the American imports from America, they, they wiped the floor with us and then the imports dropped from the States. And so then the Aussies and Kiwis did as well and started wiping the floor with us. It seems sweet but foolish in my <laughs> mind to have done this thing. I like this idea of the sharing of cheese knowledge because it goes back to the monasteries, you know, and, and, and you know, 
monasteries sharing knowledge with each other and from you know one abbey to another I, I just want to go back to joe schneider because he said i think just one of the most lovely things about this there was talk of apprenticeships and and some people saying i don't want people coming to my dairy looking at what i do and joe said to me look you can come you can take photos you can write notes uh, you'll never know how to make my cheese because i don't know how to make my cheese <laughs> In the sense that he has to keep responding to what's going on, and you know, and so I, in a way, I wouldn't worry, but clearly the Aussies and Xerxes will have sorted something. Listen, guys, I've got, I've got lots of good questions that have now flooded in, which is good, and we've got sort of eight or nine minutes to, to, to go through them. Um, uh, so there was a very good question uh, from Angela uh, asking about to what extent is cheese seasonal? which I think the St. James sheep's milk cheese is a good example of that, isn't it? I don't know if, if one of you wants to come in on well, seasonality. It's, really, it's hard to get sheep to give you milk all year round. Uh, so yes, there is. Um, and, and, and Martin got kind of troubled by it because he'd run out of cheese at Christmas, which is just when you want to be selling tons of cheese. Um, and I think historically even cow's milk was more seasonal. But what do you think, Harry? Well, absolutely. That, that's right. And, and look, for example, to the Mediterranean, where uh, people are keen to time their sheep's milk cheese production uh, to, to sync up with when lambs are slaughtered for religious festivals. Um, you know, so, so, you know, everything goes together. Uh, the, the lambs are, are, are weaned, the lambs are slaughtered, and then you can be milking uh, the ewes to make the cheese. Um, but it doesn't go too deep into the into the summer, um, and the the you know the flocks begin to dry off, and and no cheese is made until the next season. That yeah, it's a, I've got some really good great questions coming in. Um, someone someone was asking about chutney. This is, we're going to bounce around a bit now. When did you start to see chutney as an accompaniment to cheese, and do you endorse it? Um, <laughs> I don't know, well, any it's, it's, it's an Indian. It's an Indian word, and it's an Indian product originally. Though they probably wouldn't recognise Branston pickle or something. But it. But <laughs> so I guess it it arrived with, um, you know, the beginnings of our troubled involvement with India. Although actually, if you think about, um, I was thinking about the Crusaders coming back and loving sweet and savoury mixtures because I think that's a very sort of Persian, Middle Eastern kind of. Way of eating, and I think maybe things like fruit cheese, you know, damson paste, which I think is much more ancient, is something that might have come from from that idea of mixing sweet and savoury products. It could be really ancient. As a younger monger, I was a bit of a purist, and I wouldn't have anything with cheese at all. I was very cross about it. If people did, you know, you want to experience favour. No, I love it. Sweet and sweet and sour is a lovely mix. Randolph Hodgson made us stock Branston pickle at the dairy because he liked it. And so we had banks to pickle. Well, honey, you'd think honey, those are, you know, doorstone with a little drizzle of honey. One of these, you know, one of the first cheeses, these lactic goat's cheeses, there would have been honey around. Oh, I'm sure they did that. It wouldn't have taken much for someone to try a bit of honey with a with a, a Neolithic uh, goat's cheese, would it? I mean, you know, it's probably going to have happened. Um, let's have a look. We've got um, some about sort of British cheese making now, a couple of questions around that. Um, someone's saying Britain's in a golden age of cheese making at the moment with artisan cheese, sort of, you know, so many new producers. Um, can we feel optimistic that the cheese industry will remain in a positive state for many years to come now? Are we in a golden age of British cheese, do you think? Harry, you've got this. Well, I, I, I think so. I mean, we've seen a, a real fluorescence of, of, of cheese making, you know, over the last uh, few decades, really. Um, and, and, and cheese making in this country is in very good shape. I mean, we always have to be careful. Um, you know, uh, changing markets after Brexit are going to create changing conditions for the dairy industry. Uh, they're going to ch create changing dynamics about how people make their um, make enough money to, to, to cover their, their payments, right? Um, so we need to be looking at, at the underlying kind of political economy of land um, and how that might affect people who are involved in cheese making, not only the sort of markets that may be changing in, 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 in coming years. But I think the UK is in a very good position right now in terms of artisan cheese making. Uh, 
how does that compare to other countries? I mean, Ned, I mean, France is always held up as the yeah the, the home is, of um, great cheese, and we always sort of look to France as the sort of you know they're, they're way ahead of us in artisan cheese. But how do we compare to internationally? Do you think? Well, just to take France. I think I know a bit more about in, in, in the some of my fellow French cheesemongers are they are worried a bit that people are maybe a bit complacent and that people are going to shop at supermarkets a bit more. And perhaps with this notion that, well, it's fine, you know, we know we've got this lovely stuff and, and, and it's there and so we can go and do this. But I think they've seen a bit of a trajectory away from their independent fromage, you know, cheese shops and, and away from that a bit. Whereas, whereas we've obviously gone in the other Direction such that at one point Randolph and his 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 henchman Jason Hines were invited to France to talk to people about how to sell artisanal <laughs> cheese, which we thought was massively amusing, you know. And I do think for us, just when I started in two thousand, the demographic was largely people quite affluent, quite middle class, and already knew a fair bit about food, you know. And I feel that's changing all the time, and that when I do any retail now, I see I do I see. Um, a much broader age range and demographic and and any you know, people oh, can i just have 150 grams and i i really love that so if anything i'm actually a little bit more worried about about what's happening in in france and i think it's a bit like what harry said before because we lost so much almost as if we value it more yeah, i'm not sure about the other european countries yeah well i, I did an art looking at there's quite a lot of pressure on on cheesemakers in, in europe and well harry you've probably come across this in your travels but in terms of legislative pressures on them. Um, so going back to that idea of, um, of food safety and raw milk and and actually, you know, in France, there's been sort of moves by the government to make it more difficult for raw, you know, more hurdles for smaller cheesemakers to, to have to jump over if they're using raw milk, which I think is adding to the pressure, as well as the things of like you mentioned, Ned, about the rise of supermarkets and you know, just generally shopping more in supermarkets in France. But there's a whole host of reasons, I think. Did you find that? Is, is there more sort of leg legislative pressure on the smaller producers, do you think, Harry? Well, the European Union created legislation which had to be translated into law in each country. Um, and you see that rolling out in, 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 in different countries at different moments over about a two decade period. When it rolled out in France, for example, it was, it was vicious. Lots of lots of farmers went, went out, of, out of cheese making. Um, and you know, it, it's less than 7% of cheese uh, consumed in France is raw milk cheese uh, today. Um, so they have an excellent underlying infrastructure to be training people in cheese making, um, but they really are uh, uh, on the defensive, on the decline. And, and look across the channel and see things that they're quite envious of in terms of public, you know, in, in investment in the idea of of uh, of you know uh, foods that are made locally and foods that are made in, in in you know traditional ways. I guess would be the way to summarize it. That's a hell of a stat, isn't it? Less than 7% of French cheese, or 7% of French cheese is raw milk. I mean, that's... It's that's, appalling. It's shocking, actually, isn't that it? That is really... That's a really, well, what's, really quite remarkable. I wonder what the percentage is here, though. And I, you I can look it up. I, I've done, if you look on the Specialist Cheesemakers Association website, you, they've got this great uh, resource for looking... Well, as you, I'm sure you spent hours on there, Ned, looking up cheeses. But you can, I think you can filter them by raw milk and pasteurised. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and it's quite a lot, actually. It's, it's, it's hundreds, yeah. you know, yeah. um, that are raw milk. Um, a, a question that sort of ties in with that we've been given a dispensation of an extra five minutes because because uh, which, you know, because cheese is wonderful. Um, a question around why there was this renaissance in, in British cheese sort of from, I suppose, from the 1980s, early 90s onwards. What, what, why has this happened? I don't know who wants to come in on that. And I just, there's a really short term answer, which is hilarious, but it is, it's from a lovely woman called Val Bynes. It's one of the most important cheese teachers in Britain has taught everyone whose cheese we love. And then they've taught other people. She, I asked her, she said, oh, it was the good life. <laughs> because the good life just came on TV and, and it was about people going back to land and it was fun. And a bunch of people, you know, it's early 70s where so they got made redundant, they got nice packages. And so they thought, I'll do that, make cheese. That's what Val says. <laughs> 
I, I I'm sure Harry's got a more grown up answer. <laughs> I was I always thought EasyJet had quite a lot to play as well because well, she no, she also said because I said why Continental? Why didn't they make their Gloucester? Why didn't they revive Double Gloucester? You know, what was that? She said they went on package holidays, yeah. They had fancy she called fancy foreign cheese, she literally called it that, and they wanted to make that. They didn't want to make boring single Gloucester, they wanted to make a poiss. Well, I th- I, for yeah, me, it was in the 90s when these low-cost airlines came in. Everybody suddenly <laughs> went to Europe seven times a, a year, you know, for weekend trips to Portugal and south of France and, you know, and, and then wanted these cheese when they got... I don't know, Harry, are, are we being flippant? Is, do you think these are true uh, trends? No, I, I, think, I think these are these are all pieces of the puzzle. I think there are lots mm. of different reasons. I think it starts with the kind of back-to-the-land movements and, and suspicion mm. of the kind of hyper-industrialization that yeah. we see in the post-war period. Um, but but there are there, there's there's chapter upon chapter of this and people coming at it. And you know, today there are people who are very interested in sustainability. And for them, sustainability goes along with embeddedness in in, in a local uh, e- ecological context. And they see small scale food production as being part of that. Yeah, I think restaurants, I think Jamie Oliver had a lot a big part to play. Yeah. Um, you know, with the, in the 90s when you know, Jamie Oliver was driving around London on his scooter and, and food, everybody sort of got into food and cookbooks and you had TV chefs and rest. There was this huge restaurant boom as well yeah. in the 90s. Where- but you've got to, I mean, I think you're entirely correct, but it was that was happening before. But it's the same thing. So these sort of ripples or waves, they keep on. I don't know what's the word. They keep on rippling. And I think in the 70s, it was exactly that too. A sense of wanting sustainability, a bit of a distrust of industrial farming. I think also the food's boring. The cheese is so boring. Perhaps not old enough to remember. So boring. And people and bread was boring. Beer was boring. The campaign for real ale and the campaign for real bread all started around the same time as... I mean, I locate the beginning of the race maybe in the mid-ish 70s when, when Mary when Mary's husband made them go and live on the family farm and she got bored and started making cheese and messing about, but that didn't filter through. I mean, you could say that 79 when the dairy opened is like a, a beginning point, but it was already bubbling away, you know, then I think for the same reasons. Listen, we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, should we just do a, a few quick fire questions just to finish up um, where like we just keep the answers written to get through as many as we can. Um, so there's a, there's some f- a few kind of okay, Harry. What's the worst cheese you've ever eaten? <laughs> <laughs> I had a ten year old Salers that was effervescent. It was like it was like um, yeah, it fizzed in your mouth. Acrid. <laughs> we, ne- we, we never. That sounds got- amazing. Yeah, the, the, the wrong kind of firework. Ned, what about you? <laughs> worst cheese ever. <laughs> oh, I, I'm just going to be an arse. And it, I mean, it's the sort of really the bad block cheddar that is both sweet and sour in a really unnerving way. And the only cheese I've ever thrown away, bought a shed load of it for a training session and chucked it. Um, cheese that pretends to be something else. I like baby bell. It doesn't pretend to be anything else. Yeah. But I don't like, you know, special mature block because it's not. I had a t- I had a Thai green, uh, Thai green curry cheddar once, which, no! was, which was pretty... I, I had to buy it. I was just like, you know, what? Yeah, yeah. what? Uh, and I shouldn't yeah. have, you know, yeah. as, as you would expect. Um, OK, quick one for you, Ned. Jane Austen fam- famously dined on her favourite toasted cheese in her Hampshire home. What cheese do you think her cook would have used? Good Jane Lord. Austen, 1775 to 1870. Cheshire. It Cheshire, Cheshire. Cheshire yeah. OK, Austen. that was the king Cheshire. cheese in that period. Yeah. And, 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 and let yeah. me see, what else? Uh, this is a we could maybe go a little bit longer, and it's 30 seconds. And he's has eating cheese, different cheeses ever been associated with different social status? I'm thinking of how soft cheese is more precarious, and wondering if that made it more valuable in the past. Are, are there periods all these notes are about that? All these <laughs> notes are about that issue. That's what I wanted to talk about all night. Yeah, I think there's cheese is very split full fat cheese for the rich, hard dry portable cheese for the poor so that would be single gloucester for the poor double gloucester, double for, the gloucester rich. for the rich yeah 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 what do you think kerry in in serpa it was the unctuous soft ones that were for the table of the landlords and it was the hard discs that would last for months that were for the laborers because they wouldn't be tempted to eat them all at once yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> so mean. That must be where hard cheese comes from, as a saying, isn't it? So your hard cheese. <laughs> I think we've done quite well. I think I'm, I'm terribly sorry to anyone whose question we didn't quite. Oh, no, there was one more. Can I just do this one quick? Because I was I just thought it was I, I don't really understand the question. And then Polly can can cut in and, and stop me. But um, someone was asking about my husband swears he went to cheese placing school in Leeds in the 1970s. Is there any evidence for this or has he been fooling me and our children for over 30 years? I want to know what cheese placing school is. Have either of you heard of cheese placing school? Well, I think on that, we'd be, <laughs> on that bombshell, I think we should, <laughs> there's, there's some research for us all to do after this session. Yes. Go and find out what is a cheese placing school and did it exist in Leeds in the, in the 1970s. I'm hoping Polly can uh, join us now. We've, we've reached our time. I'm here, Hi. I'm here. <laughs> that was brilliant. I love the idea of a cheese placing school. It sounds like a better option to a finishing school, doesn't it? It's like <laughs> sort of the more attractive version. Absolutely brilliant discussion. Thank you so much. I feel like uh, I have to think we've solved the problem of the school curriculum because we should just cheat. Just cheese is it, isn't it? You can do geography and history. You've just romped through, I think, 4,000 years of history coming right up to date. We've got everything in there, industrialization, sort of politics, gender, everything. So I think the curriculum could just simply be replaced with cheese, which is excellent news. I have managed to eat my body weight in cheese, slightly embarrassing. I ate almost that whole piece of Stitchelton. I want to thank all of you for the most fantastic discussion. It was really, really fascinating. Great fun as well. Um, thank you for such a great selection of cheeses and to talk about them in such detail. And thank you for the audience who sent in so many wonderful questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to uh, as many as we would have liked. This event could have gone on for two hours, probably for two weeks. Perhaps we should do a residential course. That would be brilliant. Um, I would like to say thank you very much to KitchenAid for sponsoring this event. And thank you to you, the audience. Don't forget to look at the British Library Food Season web pages for next event tomorrow night's uh, discussion with historians talking about the extraordinary lives of Winston Churchill's cook and the food writer Florence White will be amazing. And there's much more too. Good night. <laughs>